Welcome to our second uh, part lecture on kind of models of learning. Today we'll look into the North Indian or Hindustani kind of classical music uh, model of learning and the kind of relationship between teacher and student in this system. Um, I think it's a great contrast to the previous lecture on uh, Western uh, conservatory tradition, and I think you'll find some really interesting things here. We won't have time to go too in depth into uh, Indian music in general. I, I, you could study this for years. Uh, you could study even just the content of this lecture for years. But we'll try to give you. I'll try to give you an overview uh, of the important points, highlight some of the things from the article you read, and give you maybe some some basis where you can go off and maybe explore if in, if um, Hindustani music is interesting to you. You can explore it further on your own. As there are a lot of resources out there on YouTube, especially lots of videos and and recordings. So I just wanted to give you a an overview of, kind of where we're talking about. So this is a picture, a map of India. And if you, Hindustani music, the music, uh, the classical music of the North India is really practiced from, um, you know, at least uh, if you look in the center or lower center of your map, Hyderabad and, and above, at least in that area, kind of Hyderabad and North, uh, practice all throughout India and into Pakistan, into, into Nepal, parts of Bangladesh, etc. So it's a really, it's a dominant, form of classical music um, for all, you know really billions of people. Um, there's another system of uh, Indian classical music called the Carnatic system and it's slightly different. It has kind of a shared heritage but it's different and that's practiced more in the south. Um, if you look at the very bottom of your screen, Madras and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, those states and cities there, that, that part of the south India has a slightly different form of classical music that we won't really touch on. Um, but like I said, they're, they're both related in, in some senses. Um, the beginning uh, of Hindustani music, so there's been music in an Indian subcontinent for you know ten, thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. But really when you have the um, Hindustani music that we kind of know of today, the first and most important thing to remember is that yes, while it is very old, many thousands of years old, it's been constantly adapting, constantly changing to the different cultural, social conditions in the subcontinent over the years. And it's, and it's not a static music. So what you're hearing today in performances on YouTube, when you hear Ravi Shankar or Vlad Khan play the sitar or other people singing, um, what you're hearing today is the modern form. And so I want to kind of dispel the illusion that it's somehow unchanged or hasn't been, um, hasn't changed with, uh, with the social conditions at the time. But we can look back in, in history and we know that before a kind of the, there was a Muslim conquest of, of India, kind of these invaders, quote unquote, came to India from the north, from Afghanistan, from uh, Iran, etc. They kind of came into India and settled there. They kind of conquered the place. They settled in North India, especially in, in Delhi and Lucknow and places like that. And they, uh, these settlers, these conquerors uh, integrated with the kind of native Indian population and, and really made a whole new culture kind of start flourishing. And so you have, um, you have um, uh, rulers, rulers by the, you know, going by the names of the Delhi Sultanate, or you have the Mughal Empire, maybe you've heard of, um, but there's, these are long lasting kind of empires and ruling uh, kingdoms and families that really helped shape the culture of North India um, and the music as well. And so um, Hindustani really, music really began evolving and, and continues to evolve after about 1200 AD or CE um, when these invaders, quote unquote, came in. And what they did when they came in is not only they brought outside elements, they brought some elements of, of Persian culture, of Turkic culture, and they fused these into these, these more uh, native Indian elements. And so what you get is this kind of um, interesting um, mixture of uh, music and culture that uh, persisted for many hundreds uh, of years, really or thousands of years. Um, this music we're talking about is really court music, and it was supported by wealthy patrons, sort of by kings and maharajas and rajas, etc. And um, this is kind of the, the support and the way the social system and economic system was set up in India uh, through until really the modern age. Um, you have a slightly different relationship between teacher and student and patron and musician than you do in 
with in the West and in Europe and America when we talked about the conservatory culture and the transmission of music that way. And we'll explore some of that later on. You read about it in your article, the you know, guru shishya parampara, which is the guru student student teacher relationship. Um, and we'll talk about that more as time goes on. But just knowing that the kind of economic conditions between kind of wealthy court um, you know, king or whatever you want to call them, and their musicians, and then also the the relationship between the teacher and student of music was um, is dramatically different than what you'll find in the West. So before we move on too far, I want to talk a little bit about the the music itself, since maybe this may be the first time you've heard some uh, Hindustani North Indian music. And there's a couple terms that we should we should understand. And the first term is is raga. I'm sure you've heard the term rag or raga. And really, what this is is kind of the overall system that Indian music is performed in. It's not a key. It's not. Um, it's not a. It's it's really a, a a broad system of music. And I'll explain exactly what that means. So what is raga? Raga is the melodic system used in Hindustani music. Um, I, I, my shorthand for explaining it is a tonal framework for composition and improvisation. And so ragas have fixed scales, they have catchphrases, they have rules of movement, and they and ragas themselves. Remember, this is kind of a tonal system that has many compositions that are um, remembered by performers uh, and it, it really composed by performers. Um, so a raga is not one composition, it's this, it, you know, this tonal framework. And in, inside of this raga, so if you have one raga, you have many thousands of compositions, um, the performers, be them vocalists, uh, sitarists, um, flute players, etc., would typically write their own compositions, or not, I say write, actually all these compositions are oral, orally transmitted. There's no um, uh, written music system in Indian music. Um, so these performers will create these compositions and then pass them down through their family, through their from teacher to student or father to son. And really what, what this makes up is kind of a lineage of, of music, um, a little bit different than when you have written compositions in the West where you have, let's say, Beethoven writing a symphony, and that is passed on in a written form in a fairly um, exact uh, copy really uh, that we can play of to, for the most part. These compositions in Indian music are fairly short, uh, between 10 and 30 seconds long, and really they're the basis for extended improvisation. And so that's what you have most of all of Hindustani music is uh, a composition that is played in kind of a rhythmic cycle, a melodic cycle played over and over again. And uh, as you go out from that composition, it's a lot of improvisation. So typically you'll have a concert that is you know an hour and a half two hours long and what you actually hear the composition for is maybe five or ten minutes maybe throughout the total total of the piece and the rest of it is improvisation it's also important to note that within the raga system uh, within these uh, compositions what you're hearing uh, typically is a melody instrument or vocal and a rhythm rhythmic instrument so um, like let's say you hear the sitar and the tabla, the tabla with the double drums, or the vocalist and a tabla player. Um, what you're not hearing is you're not hearing harmony. So there's no harmony. There's generally there's no um, sense of uh, you know there's no sense of chords. There's no sense of key. It's a um, it's a very it's a very melody and a rhythmic based uh, style of music. So not to go too far into it, but that's just kind of a very brief overview of what is a raga, the fact that it's a kind of a, a overarching system for composition and improvisation. And underneath that raga, you'll have compositions that are the basis for improvisation. Unlike keys, you won't have modulation. You won't, there will always be kind of a, be a bass note, a kind of a drone note that you'll always be fixed on, that of the main note saw. And um, you'll have ascending and descending rules of movement. If you go up the scale, you have to do certain things, and going down the scale, you do certain different things. Um, so it's a, it's a very complex system. Um, in, even without the introduction of harmony, it's um, really a very rich uh, melodic and rhythmic system. So raga is this tonal framework, but it also, raga has a lot more uh, connotations to it than just music. Uh, the word raga actually means color, but it has all sorts of associations with uh, particular moods, emotions, colors, seasons, and times of day. And so there are many rules of um, 
of performance that ragas that you generally would follow in a performance uh, in, a, in, a, in a concert. Um, so typically you, on the right hand side of your screen you can see a little kind of a wheel of different times of day and different ragas that are appropriate for being played at that time of day. It's because it, it's thought in the kind of Hindustani system that certain ragas evoke certain emotions uh, in uh, even just by the, the the playing of them they kind of create these types of emotions and the emotions are you know um, thoughtful or rev or, you know um, reverent or um, uh, heroic or romantic etc and so depending on the raga you want to kind of match that with the time of day there are also ragas that are played only in specific seasons and so in, in India you have uh, kind of a dry season and a rainy season, and so sometimes you have ragas that are played only in the rainy season, uh, for example. So just to give you a, a really brief overview of, of the kind of melodic system used in Indian music, um, ragas are not just melody and composition, they have a lot more connotations outside of um, just pure music. And in some ways, although they're not related systems, you can you can think uh, back to our discussion of the in kind of the Baroque times and some of the other previous lectures, we talked about how people thought that certain keys had certain um, emotional affect. So we would talk about the doctrine of affections in the Western kind of Baroque period. And it's somewhat similar, although they're not related at all. I don't want to confuse that. But it's somewhat similar the idea that certain ragas are very evocative of certain types of emotions and certain types of uh, feelings and, and seasons and times. So we've got a very, very, very brief overview of the idea of raga and compositions. Um, I want to talk about some of the socio-musical features of Hindustani music that you read about quite a bit in your in the chapter from Dan Newman's book. Um, the first one is uh, we talked about how performers they create their compositions and then they pass those down to their students or their through their family and and this is really important in the Indian music system. There's this idea of a, a musical lineage. And the term that sometimes is used is garana, which is literally uh, means like house of music, gar meaning house, and and uh, this is a, a stylistic lineage. Um, and typically, the stylistic lineage uh, is hereditarily based. So you'll have your father or your uncle who is a performer, and you study with them, and they pass that music down to you. You'll pass it down to your son or or um, or nephew, or what what have you, and so what you have is this lineage of musicians, of stylistic, you know, ways of playing music, styles of music, specific compositions that are passed down in the garana, and um, that's what really makes up the kind of bulk of the stylistic elements of Hindustani music. In the beginning, garanas were really only uh, we talked about vocal garana, so vocal styles of of uh, performance. Um, that in later on, that, that, that's that been really happening since the uh, 15, 1600s. There were kind of this sense of a vocal style or school of, of music. And the idea of the instrumental gharanas was later added in, you know, maybe the 17, 1800s. And, and then even later on, there were tabla gharanas. These kind of uh, accompanying instruments also kind of began to speak of themselves as school, stylistic schools. Um, and now, really, in the in the 21st century, the idea of garana is becoming less and less important, and there's a variety of reasons for that. I think, first and foremost, is the kind of changing economics of uh, making music in India, um, how it's not this um, teacher-student relationship that we'll talk about in a second. It's not as as strong as it used to be, maybe. Um, the fact that there are recordings out there that you can listen to other um, performances and kind of model yourself after other musicians kind of in a, in a way um, affects the the um, lineage or the kind of purity of that lineage if you're borrowing from other people and so um, there's a debate now whether or not the idea of Karana which was really central to several hundred years of stylistic music making whether or not that'll actually continue on in the future so moving on from the idea of a stylistic lineage or house of music or Karana um, I want to talk about one more very important um, term that was mentioned in your article and discussed, and that's of riaz. And riaz is really um, more than just practice. Um, this is what makes musicians musicians. Riaz is a is a is a demonstration of their achievement and a demonstration of their potential. In some ways, like I talked about talent in the last 
uh, lecture when we're talking about conservatory system, how talent is so central to the idea of being in music in the West. In, in the Indian system, the idea of practice or devotional practice or riyas is far more important than the idea of any sort of innate talent. And so what riyas is, is, is this devotional practice. It's a beyond just regular practice. This is intense, intense practice. You know, it almost in, in some senses has a religious connotation. It certainly has a moral connotation. So intense practice with um, a, a lot of other meaning to it. And Riaz is really the hallmark of musical achievement. And so, again, contrasting it to the conservatory system where you have maybe people listening to you performing and saying, ah, you sound good, you, you have achieved something, you, you're, you're getting better in terms of using their ears in the Western conservatory system. Uh, you read in your article, and I've experienced this many times, where musicians will judge another um, student or, or a musician's accomplishment or achievement by the intensity of their riyaz, the intensity of their practice. And so you have many famous stories like um, in your article you read about Dan Newman always wanting marks on his fingers to show that he had been practicing hard or there's stories of um, Ravi Shankar or Vlad Khan tying their hair up to the wall so they couldn't fall asleep when they were practicing the, uh, so intensely late, late for many, many hours into the night. Um, there's a story of my teacher's father who um, was practicing a certain movement on the sitar so much that behind him there was blood flicked on the walls because his fingers were bleeding but he kept practicing kept practicing practicing even through that pain um, and this all sounds kind of um, maybe fantastical but i can tell you that it's very much uh, still um, these, these types of um, judgments of riyaz are still very central to uh, how musicians and teachers judge Musician, other musicians and students. So my first trip to India uh, with my first sitar teacher, I was walking on the street. We met an, with my teacher and we met another uh, friend of his, musician. And my teacher introduced me. Said he's, you know, this, this boy is learning sitar. And the first thing he did was he, the other musician grabbed my hand, my left hand, and looked at my fingertips and made sure was checking visually checking my the kind of calluses on my fingers that you get from playing sitar. And it wasn't he didn't need to hear me. Uh, he didn't need to, to know what I sounded like, but he wanted to check just by the kind of physical marks on my fingers, the intensity of my riyaz. Um, thankfully, I had been practicing really hard and I had these mountainous calluses that were black from the strings, etc. And so I was maybe, you know, it was a good thing. Uh, thankfully, he didn't see me several months later where I hadn't practiced. But the whole point is that this the idea of riyaz is, is very central to the achievement of musicians, to the, is, a, is a hallmark of musical achievement. It's a devotional practice, and it's really central to the, the um, uh, a musician's demonstration of their commitment to music. In, in a sense, this is much more important than the idea of talent in the West. Uh, the idea that riyaz or devotional practice is, is very central to Hindustani music. I wanted to mention one more a very brief term I didn't write up there. You don't really need to uh, write it down in your notes, but the idea of chilla, which is that uh, Dan Newman talked about it in your article. Um, it's this idea of kind of this 40 day period where you intensely practice something. And that's still um, still about, it's it's used in music and it's used in other, other areas of life. But um, I've known many musicians who've kind of um, performed with chilla and they, they've kind of sequestered themselves for 40 days or so to learn a certain technique or, or whatever it is. But it, again, this is the idea of chilla, this kind of 40 day concentration on something with intense, intense devotion where you do nothing else besides practice this certain thing in the musical world. Um, that is kind of another hallmark of the importance of riyaz, the importance of the intensity of your practice, the intensity of your devotion to music um, rather than any sort of um, oral or audible judgment of your of your accomplishments. If you are known to have gone and, and performed these chillas for 40 days, um, it's, it's another demonstration of your devotion to music. So I wanted to give you really briefly um, just two examples. These are instrumental examples of two different styles of playing the sitar. And I, it's hard to do this because it really, it would take really everyone years to, of study to really hear uh, the, the very strong differences in, in sitar performance style that, you're gonna, that you can hear with these two videos. Um, but I'll give you a little example of it, just a little taste of it while we can. Um, 
these again, like I said, these the idea of garana is a is a stylistic school that started off with vocal music and then eventually added instruments to the idea of different stylistic schools. And um, what you have here, what you can pause this lecture and listen to, are two different examples of two of the kind of most famous sitar players in the 20th century. Um, Ravi Shankar, who you've heard of, I'm sure, because of his asso association with the Beatles, and, um, and also a fabulous musician, the most well-known sitarist of the 20th century, and uh, Vlad Khan, who is um, also thought of as the, the best sitarist of the 20th century, um, maybe quite not quite as known in the West because of he didn't he wasn't associated with, with the Beatles. Um, so what I, what I wanted to do is pause the lecture, uh, listen to. Um, Listen to both videos if you can. Listen to both videos and um, uh, come back and try to try to make some take some notes on what you hear. So in the first video, listen to um, uh, from from around the minute mark of four and listen to what you're hearing in terms of timbre, in terms of the way Ravi Shankar is approaching playing the composition, which is that repeated melody figure you'll hear, and maybe his approach to melody, etc. So again, Ravi Shankar, I start at around the minute four, and you'll hear um, the composition part of the, the piece. And in the Vlad Khan, in the second video, um, I want you to listen from about minute 9.30. Uh, and again, listen to the differences in way the way he produces sound, the way he approaches melody. And do that, and we'll come back, come back to the lecture, and I'll maybe give you a few hints about maybe what you heard. So I uh, hope you enjoyed the pieces. These are two um, very similar, very closely related ragas, so two t melodic frameworks that they're playing in, although they're not quite the same. It's a little hard to find uh, preeminent musicians playing necessarily the same raga, and it's almost it is impossible to find <laughs> preeminent musicians playing the same raga in the same composition because really, as I mentioned, the performers make their own compositions and they're not necessarily shared between stylistic schools. You'll occasionally find uh, the exception to this rule is when you're finding uh, musicians playing together. Uh, uh, sometimes there's a duet type of music that is occasionally played where you'll have both musicians playing in the same uh, composition. But in terms of style, what you heard really, what I hear when I hear Ravi Shankar is I hear there's a timbral difference in the way his sitar produces sound. It's a more of a buzzy sounding um, uh, instrument. Um, I think Ravi Shankar has a greater emphasis on um, rhythmic uh, complexity in his melodic phrasing, and so you have more of a kind of a rhythmic approach, more of a, a almost um, pre-composed uh, uh, approach to his melodic kind of flourishes and etc., and a little less bending of the notes, a little narrower range when he bends notes uh, on the sitar. And I wish you could all be in person with me in class, and I could demonstrate this for you, but unfortunately, you'll have to suffer through. Uh, an online video. But um, that's what I hear when I hear the Ravi Shankar example playing. Um, when you hear the other example from Vlad Khan, what you're hearing is a little bit different approach to melody. His instrument sounds a little different. It's a little more of a kind of a cleaner sound, not quite the buzzy sound. And these are just aesthetic differences. I'm not saying one is better than the other. But Vlad Khan's sound is a little more pure sound just because of the way he's, he's set up his instrument. Um, and his approach is a little bit more focused on emulating uh, the vocal qualities or human vocal voice qualities. So he has a lot more um, notes that he'll pull in one stroke. So he'll stroke with his right hand to give a, strike the strings and then kind of draw out notes with his left hand a little bit more because he has more of an emphasis on vocalism on the instrument. Um, so those are just two you know, two really broad examples of the differences in Garana styles that you have just on the on the sitar, and I chose these because um, uh, they're they're you know, melodies without words makes them a little easier. They are two of the kind of preeminent musicians of the 20th century, um, and they're playing in almost the same raga, which is um, which is again like hard to find. But like I said, there's a million other videos out there for Indian music, so I would really encourage you to go listen to more examples, find something you like, and keep going down the rabbit hole of YouTube and Indian music. So it's really an amazing uh, music system that, that everyone should spend more time learning about. So I wanted to again, now we move on to the idea of the Guru Shishya um, tradition, Guru Shishya Parampara, which is the, the 
teacher-student tradition. And I also put up there the Ustad Shagir, which is the um, Muslim version of the same thing. Um, this is foundational. This is unlike the conservatory in the West, which is an institutional um, a system of learning music. The Guru Shishya system is really central to learning Indian music in the Hindustani system. Um, it is not an institution like I mentioned. Um, it is a very personal relationship between teacher and student, and it's the foundation of all musical learning in the Hindustani classical system. Um, as you're reading in the in the article or in the chapter of the book you read for this lecture, um, it's a social relationship that's very much bound up with love and devotion respect and um, these are all central to the, the teacher student relationship um, and so as you meant you read in the, the chapter many times um, a, a student is expected to behave in certain ways around their teacher like they'll never they won't um, they won't be smoke or drink around their teacher they'll never sit higher than their teacher it's always a, a, a power dynamic in the relationship so the teacher is always going to be placed in this kind of reverent position this reverent status um, and this comes about. This manif is manifested not just in the music lesson, quote unquote, even though it's not quite as uh, really lessons in a Hindustani sense, but throughout daily life, really. Um, students were oftentimes historically were almost accepted into the guru's family, and the students would perform menial tasks. They would, you know, iron their guru's clothes. They would do the, you know, whatever they would do, the small things around the house to help out. Um, and then receive this musical knowledge, this kind of musical way of being, being a musician um, as, a, as part of the relationship. Um, as mentioned again in the chapter, money was never really uh, central to the teacher student relationship. That's changing a little bit nowadays in the contemporary times where um, in many cases, uh, Hindustani teachers are kind of emulating this kind of lesson format you have in the West where you have an hour lesson and you pay for the hour lesson and you go home and you practice on your own. Um, but historically, it's been a much more involved relationship where the teacher, the student will actually move in with the teacher and learn music all throughout the day or whenever the teacher wants to teach it. Um, it's a much more uh, engrossing relationship than you would have maybe with uh, as opposed to a conservatory teacher where you meet in a very formal setting um, and only for a few hours a day. The idea that music learning goes on at all times of the day is absolutely true. I can give you one example from my own experience. Uh, I was with my uh, my second sitar teacher in, in Delhi and we were out, I think, Going, we're going on some errands, running some errands, and I think it was either he or his wife were going to the dentist, and I was waiting in the waiting room with him. And all of a sudden, he had an inspiration. He said, "Get out a pen and paper right now!" And so, in the dentist office, he started singing to me, and I started writing down as quickly as I could to remember, just jotting notes down on myself what he was what he was teaching me. And so, that's an example of it's it's not a formalized lesson structure like you may have at a conservatory it is very much kind of an all-encompassing all-engrossing type of relationship and as i said this is central to the indian way of learning it's also essential to it's the foundation of a musician's lineage right and so you have this teacher student relationship this passing on of musical knowledge and this is why the idea of Qurana or lineage is so important in the Indian music system because they're passing on musical skill, they're passing on style, they're passing on compositions. And because of its all-encompassing en all aspect, the teacher is passing on life knowledge, how to be a musician in the musician's world. It's not just limited to music, it's how to act uh, throughout your day, throughout the, in, in the world. So this is this Guru Shishya or Ustad Shagir relationship, like I said, is central to the Hindustani m mode of learning. Um, there are there have been experiments with more institutionalized types of music learning, and these really are mostly a a result of around the turn of the 20th century. There was kind of this um, the Hindu growing Hindu middle class of India was upset that for the most part most classical music knowledge was held in the minds of these great masters who happen to be Muslim musicians because because of the way the um, you know the, the kingdom the empire was set up before um, British colonialism and and before kind of the 20th century uh, 
the, all the kind of rulers were Muslim and all the musicians were Muslim performing in the courts. And so as the Hindu middle class grew in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a, a kind of a reaction against these kind of these ustads, these masters of music who were, weren't, weren't sharing the music uh, with everyone. And so there were some experiments made with um, like schools of music, colleges of music, um, where they would try to formalize instruction. They had written textbooks, uh, etc. And these never, they're still around. They've never really produced any um, performing musicians or very few, if any, I think maybe maybe one or two, maybe none actually. <laughs> so these institutions really have no, not produced any famous performing musicians. All the musicians you'll hear of any note have to, have really come out of this guru uh, shishya relationship. Um, so the institution have really, institutionalization of Indian music hasn't happened uh, yet. So it's still very much based on this guru shishya relationship. It may or may, well, we'll see what happens in the future. That's another it's a conversation maybe for another lecture. Um, but as I said, Indian music has constantly been adapting to the social cultural circumstances of uh, where it finds it itself, and uh, it will continue to adapt. So this has been a, a lot of material, a lot of, I've talked a lot uh, fairly quickly. Um, um, so try to hopefully absorb what I've said and then we go back and listen again. If, you, if I was speaking too quickly, you can make, take some more notes. But um, what I would like you to do for the rest of the lecture is there's a linked video under the choir listening. And this is a, a, a 40 minute long video, but I would like you to watch uh, all of it if you can, but for sure watch from the minutes around seven 20 to around 25 minutes at least of uh, video number five of the, on the growing into music site. And this is the Guru Shishya relationship, the Guru Shishya Parampara. And this is a one um, well-known Sarangi player and how, and I want you to note how he, how he treats his students and how his students treat him. That's a very interesting dynamic relationship that you see. Uh, and this is more, maybe what I would say is more of a typical type uh, guru shishya relationship. Um, so at least watch those those few minutes. Try to watch the whole thing. It's a beautiful, beautifully filmed, right, a nice sound, uh, great um, video. And really, I would very much encourage you to watch. There's actually other uh, six six videos, I believe, on the site, and all talking about a different aspect of North Indian music. And I would say, look at them all. They're all wonderful videos. Uh, really well filmed. Really beautiful um, information and music in them. So. Um, this is, I want to thanks for uh, being, listening to this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, again, let me know, email me or contact me through Canvas. Your quiz will be um, made available shortly at, at around 3.30 today on Wednesday. And um, you have until again, until Friday night to take that. So the quiz is coming up. Don't forget that. And we'll see you for the next lecture. Thank you.